by the Port Authority. What normally happens is that the Ministry of Works and Transport, as you know, the, the Minister of Works and Transport would take the note to the Cabinet. cabinet. And, and once the cabinet, cabinet gives its approval, approval the, the Ministry of Works and Transport would write to the Port Authority, Authority um, indicating, indicating that, that there has been a decision and articulating in the body of that letter what the decision is, so that the note um, and minute would not reside with the Port Authority. But the Port Authority would be called upon to make payments to the millions of those vessels. So on what authority will the Port Authority be acting? You have to act on Cabinet Authority. Yes. So you must have possession of those minutes. No. I would have possession of the authority from the ministry. As a matter of fact, the Ministry of Works and Transport would be the party to the agreement, as I had indicated yesterday. And what they would do is authorize the Port Authority to make the payments uh, with respect to, we have to apply for the releases from them in any event. They provide the um, necessary subventions to the Port Authority in order to meet the payments, because this is the government shipping service um, that we are acting as agent for. So in that regard, that is how the arrangement is made. So you would say, you would say, Good morning, morning and welcome, welcome to our viewers. viewers. As, As you are aware, this is the second public hearing of the committee, committee pursuant to the committee's, committee's inquiry into the Trinidad and Tobago Inter Island Ferry Service, service with specific focus on the procurement and management of the ferries. This, this hearing is being broadcast live on Parliament Channel 11, Parliament, Parliament Radio 105.5 FM, and the Parliament's YouTube channel, Parview. Members of the viewing and listening audience may send comments via email at pal101 at ttparliament.org or on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ttparliament or on Twitter at ttparliament. I take this opportunity to again welcome the chairman and accompanying representatives of the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. I am, of course... Steve McCreese, Senator and Chairman of this committee. I will now invite members of the committee on my left to introduce themselves to our viewers. Good morning again. Nigel Freitas, member. Good morning and welcome. Daryl Smith, member. Franklin Khan, member. Good morning, Level Francis, member. Good morning, Weedmark, member. Good morning, all. Glenda Jennings Smith, member. Good morning, Rushton Parry, Vice Chairman. Thank you, members. We are now proceeding with the questions. I think Senator Mark is on the floor. Yes, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let me once again welcome the Port Authority um, team headed by Mrs. Allison. Wills, Lewis rather, here this morning once again. I was asking, I would like to ask rather, following on a submission I made yesterday, that it is very unusual for a party charter agreement to be signed by the parties involved, which is the government of TNT, through the Ministry of Works and Transport, and the particular owners of the vessels, Bridgman Services Group LP, and having the cabinet of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago subsequently, literally, rubber stamping that decision of these parties. Based on your submission yesterday in response, you did indicate that was a bit irregular or with that effect. I wanted to ask whether this is a practice 
that is going to continue under your stewardship because it happened under your stewardship. And secondly, whether you would be kind enough to make available copies of the minutes of the 20th of June, 2017, as it relates to the cabinet minute involving the Cabo Star, and the 30th of June involving the ocean flower. Would you like to guide me on this matter, Madam Chair? Through you, Chair. As I indicated uh, yesterday when the question was posed, um, firstly, firstly, I would respond to the first part because you did ask me yesterday whether or not um, you know, cabinet approvals have to be got before um, contracts and so are signed, you know, for, and, and I did indicate yes, that that is a normal procedure. With respect to um, the present stance, as I indicated, the Ministry of Works and Transport is a party to the um, agreement on behalf of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. The Port Authority does not have um, copies of the actual cabinet minute. That is something that, that is not sent as a matter of course to the Port Authority. What in fact happens is that the Ministry of Works and Transport, who would take the note, the minister would take the note to the cabinet. Of course, we would assist in providing information for that note. And what would happen is that after the, the, there is a decision, when there is a decision, the Port Authority is advised of the decision that has been taken. So in effect, uh, no cabinet minute per se resides with the Port Authority, so I am unable to furnish you with a copy of that. I think that is properly before the Ministry of Works and Transport. I also ask whether the practice that has started is going to continue under your watch in terms of signing. Because remember, I have an advertisement in my file that has been issued mm -hmm. by the Port Authority for a vessel. And I want to know when that whole exercise would have been completed, whether we can find ourselves in a similar situation where the party charter agreement is signed and then the cabinet is asked to rubber stamp whether that practice is going to continue under your watch or is that going to come to an end? Well, you know, Senator, I um, cannot say I don't have control over that process. That process is a process that is done by the Ministry of Works and Transport and the Cabinet. And the Port Authority is advised, um, as I said, this is a government shipping service of which we are the agent. And we basically operate on instructions from the Ministry of Works and Transport and through the Cabinet. So therefore, um, we will continue to operate in, 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 in a manner that from our, for this board, and I can speak for this board in saying that we will follow whatever um, rules and regulations that we are governed by, and that we will take our instruction from the Ministry of Works and Transport in this regard. Other questions before I rest my case temporarily. And the, it has to do with the process, the actual marks that were awarded in the tendering process in which the Atlantic provider emerged as the winner in that transaction before the Cabo Star came on the scene. Could you advise us, first of all, the final the names of the final three vessels and their respective owners that would have been determined for the final award 
by the Port Authority Tenders Committee. The names of the three vessels, the owners of those vessels, and if you could also tell us, you know, the marks allocated to each one, how much A got, how much B got, how much C got. And if you can provide this um, body with the minutes of the proceedings of that tenders committee that finalized those results in the order in which the final award was granted to the ocean, um, the Atlantic um, Yes, um, with respect to, and I think we, we had submitted this in the document, the three uh, um, were the Atlantic provider, the Elizabeth Ross, and the MV Trinity, Trinity Transporter. Um, the vessels are could be time. Uh, I know, I know. One month minimum to get the day of the Elizabeth Ross. Yeah, I know. Okay, uh, the Elizabeth, the Atlantic provider scored 14, 14 points. Right? The Elizabeth Ross 13 and the Trinity Transporter 7 from the information that I have here. Oh, this is oh. oh, sorry. Mr. Jagannath is on the attendance committee, so he's helping me in this regard. Um, the Atlantic provider was 72 points, Elizabeth Ross, 70, and the Trinity Transporter, 67 points. The other question that you asked was the owners, I think, of, the, of those vessels. With respect to the information I have here, with respect to the Trinity, the Atlantic provider, the Atlantic provider, the registered directors and uh, the company's Ocean Starship Limited, Ms. Amanda, Ms. Amanda Chaitra Singh, and Mr. Baini Gajada. With respect to the Trinity Transporter, the directors of the Trinity Offshore Shipping Supply and Tow Limited, the company that is Mr. David Brash, Mr. Anthony Brash, and Mr. Daniel, Daniel Brash, Anthony Brash. Um, with respect to the Elizabeth Ross, we didn't have any owners. No. We didn't have the information on the owners, but that vessel was submitted by a brokerage company, Intercontinental Shipping. Question, Mr. Chairman, for this period. Um, you did indicate yesterday as well that the Ocean Flower 2 mm -hmm. was inspected by, is it Lloyd's? Register? Lloyd's Register in yeah. Korea. Um, was it the local Lloyd's or no, was no. it the foreign Lloyd's? No, sorry. This is Lloyd's Registry UK. They have got um, branches and inspectors globally, and this was inspected in South Korea by the offices of Lloyd's in South Korea. Right. Could you indicate whether the 
inspection that was done? Was it a physical um, inspection to determine C trials? Um, did it include C trials? Or what was the nature of the inspection you probably would want to share with the committee? He said it was a physical inspection done by one of Lloyd's inspectors, and it basically covered um, the machinery, the Holland machinery inspection. Was it done after or before the charter party agreements were signed on the 17th of this June? Was, this was done before. Before. Would you be kind enough to make a copy available of that report to the committee? Yeah, um, I have a couple of questions. I just want to change the topic a little bit to the procurement of the Superfast Galicia. And I know this board wasn't in place then, but so I direct this question to the, the management team at the head table so either party could feel free to respond. <clears throat> I, I want to know, can, can the port management confirm that Ms. Nairine Alfonso was retained as an attorney at law to assist the port in the procurement of a vessel for the inter-island ferry service in 2013. Is that a correct statement? No, that, that statement is incorrect. She was not retained by the port. I, I believe from the onset, she was retained by the, through the ministry, by the ministry initially to assist um, with that procurement. And eventually, um, she was invited to identify vessels that might have been available. I have some notes here which state that at a meeting held on the 30th of December 2013, <clears throat> attended by the Deputy Chair of the Port, Mr. Leon Grant, Ms. Sharon Mark and Mr. Selwyn Wong were present. She, she was given specific instruction to obtain a short-term replacement for the MV Warrior Spirit. Is that correct, Mr. Grant? Um, <clears throat> I remember... I recall that there was a meeting concerning the warrior spirit. And I know that to the ministry, she did come to the port to assist us with the warrior spirit. That I do know. There were some serious issues and problems with the warrior spirit at the time. And we were trying to find a way how we could get out of that contract. That is what I recall about the meeting. But having said that, is it true to say that the firm N.D. Alfonso and Company Limited, through its principal, Ms. Nairine Alfonso, did have a role in the procurement of the replacement of the MV Warrior Spirit on behalf of either the port or the ministry or whosoever was involved in that process. The ministry would have engaged Ms. Naira Alfonso to assist the Port Authority with respect to the warrior spirit. And subsequent to that, they may, I, I can't confirm it now because I don't have the facts in front of me, but I remembered vaguely that she was asked to assist in trying to find an urgent replacement with respect to the warrior spirit. But I also have an invoice that was presented by her firm to the Port Authority charging for those services. Okay. And it was in fact paid. I am not aware of that invoice. Okay. All right. 
Let, let me proceed further. <clears throat> How come uh, this attorney and the firm in the, the Alphonse One Company, who apparently was intrinsically involved in the, the procurement process for the replacement of the MV Warrior Spirit, who company was listed as one of the nine companies invited to tender? on a selective tender process. The firm Andy, Alfonso, and Company Limited, a law firm. Were you aware of that? Because that list came from the, the, the board's management. Board's management. Well, who will it come from? <laughs> it's a selective tender on behalf right. of the board. It has to come from the board, not from the ministry. The board would have taken a position and authorized that we go to tender, and she may have been invited, I, I don't recall her being invited by the management um, to tender for any, any, any ferry. She, her name was included in a list of nine companies on a selective tender basis to make proposals or bids for the replacement of the MV Warrior Spirit. That is a fact. The records of the Port Authority reveals that Ms. Alfonso's name was among the list. And what sort of due diligence was done there to include on the list somebody who obviously had a conflict of interest, being an advisor on the very process that her company was bidding on? The, the persons who would have made that decision are no longer employed with the Port Authority. The then general manager and um, the Port Sec at that time, they are no longer engaged with the Port Authority. So I am unable to respond to that question. I would not know what the considerations were. But the decision was taken to ask based on, on Based on the records, yes. So then, we ended up with the Superfast Galicia. Now, can the management confirm that the firm Intercontinental was not invited by the port to submit a tender? From the initial list on the records, no. But Intercontinental did, in fact, submit a tender, that one? Yes. How, how did that? eventuality ever was allowed to take place. I have, I have examined the records and <clears throat> we saw an instance where um, Intercontinental replaced Ms. Alfonso. Well, my information is that Intercontinental claimed they acted as an agent for Alfonso and Company Limited, which makes it even curiouser and curiouser. Mm -hmm. Don't you agree? It does. And then Intercontinental, acting as an agent for ND Alfonso and Company Limited, ended up winning the bid, winning the bid for a firm that was not invited to tender, winning the bid, and I have a letter that where N.D. Alfonso Unlimited wrote the port saying that Intercontinental is acting as an agent of N.D. Alfonso. Mm -hmm. If that, my dear lady, is not at best impropriety, I don't know what is. I say no more. I'll stay with the line of questioning to the port. Um, this morning we started off the present tense. I'll go back to the past and take up from where Mr. Khan left out. I want to find out, could you provide the names of the representative on the Central Tenders Board who attended that Tenders Committee meeting? Thank you. 
We can provide the name at a later stage. We don't have the name among um, the, so the buyers. I'd also like you to provide us with um, whether that person attended all the meetings. And um, I want you to give me the names, the members of the tenders committee. We had a... Um, the tenders, tenders committee. committee okay we will have to provide that because the tenders committee would have been a, a subcommittee of the board of the port authority in 2014. um what was the bidding process adopted for that um which is a bad vessel was an invitation it was a selective tender so the bids went out to selected firms Can you um, provide minutes of the tenders committee meeting relevant to the acquisition of the Superfast Galicia? I believe I asked for that yesterday. I don't think we have pulled that as yet, but we will provide it. Mr. Chair, just one question added on to that. Uh, the contract with the Superfast uh, this year was signed, as Mr. Khan just said, for ICSL, who the agents for Mr. Alfonso and company. But I want to find out who was the real owners of the vessel. You all know who was the real owners of the vessel? The, the records indicate it was Transmed. Um, so could you provide us now with the committee members for the Ocean Flower? The tenders committee members for the Ocean Flower. Those members were Commissioners Jagannath, Commissioner Primus, and Commissioner Batiste. And could you also give me the name of the Central, Central Tenders Board representative? We would have consulted with Ms. Khan. Central Tenders Board, you said? We would yes. have consulted with Ms. Khan. Did he attend the meetings? Ms. Khan? No. So he never attended any meetings with this, it's, it's, the committee? It's, it's a female, Ms. Ms. She Khan. She never attended any of the meetings with that committee? No. From the Central Tenders Board? No. OK. Thank you. Uh, true, Mr. Chairman. I would like to um, ask the following questions to Mr. Jagannath and Ms. Primus, who are on the tenders committee for the vessels that were procured through Bridgman. And yesterday, at the end of our sitting, I brought up the issue of the Dun and Bradstreet report, which Chairman Lewis answered very well in terms of what was the requirement in terms of seeing if the business had any legal issues, liens, and so on. And my proposition was that being so, any of the other data that you could have pulled from that report, in my view, it should have been relevant to the decision-making process in terms of waiting the tender. Now, in going through the documents last night, I saw a table which has a heading, the rating system for evaluation of tenders. This is a document supplied by the port, which I assume it's from your committee. And it's broken into seven areas. Each has a particular weight, age, speed and efficiency, cargo capacity, vessel suitability, delivery plan, price. Section seven, that's where I want to focus a couple questions to both of you all. 
in reading of the submissions, I am yet to see any data that would satisfy to me the requirement of Section 7. And if I can read it, Section 7 encompasses the vehicle owner operator's financial status, company's profile, industry experience, capability, and plan to execute the contract and quality systems operational plan. Now, there is some web page print out in the file. Now, I've read operational plans. I've read company profiles over the last 25 years, and very few of them is snap and, and print from the, the, the internet. But it asks specifically for the financial status of the owner charterer, the company's profile and industry's experience, the approach and methods and plan to execute the contract, and the quality management and system and operational plan, all giving you 10, 20, 30, 30 points in that waiting. What documentation did you receive from Bridgman that would have satisfied the tenders committee that uh, that company should be awarded full points. What else besides the Dun and Bad Street report that would have given information to satisfy these requirements? What are those documents? And if it's not in your package, can it be provided to this committee? Through Chair, uh, we will sub submit these documents in, in further time. By the, um, hopefully by the end of the week, through Chair. Okay. All right. Um, just one question before I move forward. Um, this is to the Chairman. Ma'am, when you started your conversation today, Upon Senator Mark's query, from what I heard, you said that the port, acting as agent for the government, will receive an instruction from the ministry to proceed with any action in terms of a note was approved by cabinet, we will pay for vessels, and we are informing you that this has happened. I assume you would have received that letter from the ministry concerning the approval by cabinet of the Cabo Star and the Ocean Flower. At that point in time of receiving that letter, were you aware that the charter agreements were signed before cabinet approved it? As far as I am aware, the uh, ministry had the necessary approvals to sign the, the, um, the charter party agreement. As I said, that charter party agreement is signed by the ministry. It is not signed by the Port Authority. So, so the Ministry of Works on Transport would get the necessary approvals that it requires before they sign the, the charter party arrangement. So, so you were not aware, and it, perhaps it may, may not have been relevant to you sitting in the port at that point in time, because it's the ministry's responsibility. But I just want to recall what you said yesterday, that that sequence is highly irregular in the running of those sorts of business in the government sector. You haven't been a permanent secretary. For, for, for many years. Is, is that a, 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 a truth assumption on my part? What I indicated um, is that normally cabinet approval is sought um, before execution. That is, that is a normal procedure, and I would imagine that the ministry would have sought the necessary approvals that it required in order to sign the agreement. Okay.
Oh, almost a forgotten man. <laughs> Good morning again, everyone. Good morning, Madam Chair. Um, I am of the view that the issues that have been discussed for the last two days, many of which have been disturbing, to say the least, point to a larger malaise that we cannot ignore. The role of this Joint Select Committee is to deal with the fundamental issues and to provide some kind of pathway to rectifying them. Yesterday I asked this question of the previous board and the response was very unsatisfactory. So I'll ask you to see if a different answer ensues. What is the nature of the relationship between the port management and the board? Well, I have to say that during the four months, five months that we have been aboard, we have had to, re to relate to the management um, quite frequently. I would say that um, there are fundamental weaknesses in the board, in the, in the management, which you know we, we try to, to, to point out and try to correct. There, there is no um, um, animosity per se or, or, or f f you know fractious, fractiousness um, between the two, but we have made it abundantly clear to the management. And this is one of the things that the board, um, because of, of, of certain weaknesses that we have perceived, particularly in terms of, you know, the, the um, documentation and, and it's the, the management's ability to execute certain instructions, that we have made it abundantly clear that we are holding them accountable for carrying out the board's decisions. You know, the, the, the board, this board of commissioners is not an executive board and we do not, and I made it very clear to the management, we do not intend to act as executive commissioners. And therefore we will be holding them accountable for whatever actions that they um, have to carry out once decisions of the board are made. So, and we intend to hold them to that. Okay, to, to keep it as simple as possible. Would I be wrong to surmise that the board is not exactly satisfied with the current state of management? If so, are there any suggestions or recommendations that will be forthcoming from the board, if not just to the port, but also maybe to government? Yes, it is correct to say that during the time that we have been there, we have had issues that we are not happy with. We recognize that the port has been left to languish for many years. And the whole question of how it is structured and how it is organized leaves a lot to be desired. As I said yesterday, we discovered that there were, one, you know, there were people and positions that were vacant for a long time. And in some instances, you had one person doing two jobs or, or taking the responsibility for two positions. And that is not an ideal situation as far as we were concerned. So we had already um, discussed the whole question of the port's reorganization and restructuring. And, you know, we had, as a matter of fact, we were given until the, the, the end of the year to come up not only with a strategic plan, a business plan, but also the way forward in terms of the organization itself, which we were to present to the ministry so that it could be taken to cabinet. Okay. One final question, Madam Chair. Port cities around the world, I mean, ports are major money spinners. Many of the premier cities in the world <clears throat> base their wealth simply on being port cities, starting there. Why is our port losing money? Now, that could be an encyclopedic answer. Should I have time for it? Could I have the cliff notes, please? No. I think, I think that essentially, as I, as I said, the port is not structured, properly structured, to really be a, an efficient and a modern day port. And you're correct, there, there are ports all over the world and countries that basically thrive on the business of the port. This is not so in, in, in our case. And, and you're correct, I, I mean, it, it, will, it will take the whole morning. But essentially, I think the port itself 
um, has, has not really been, um, the, the, the attention to the port has not been, been there, and there are practices on the port that need to be modernized, and, it need, and, and some of them outright stamped out. So I'll just add one more. If you could change two things almost immediately, what would you choose? I want to put you on the spot. Yes, you are, are putting, very me, well respected you are, you are putting me on the spot with I'm respect to that, spot. especially given my short tenure there. Um, you have a wealth of experience that I'm sure has already come to bear on this situation. I would, I would, I would immediately, as I said, you know, and my commissioners, we, we, we all agree on this, that the whole business model of the port has to change. And I think the, 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 the other thing, I mean, and that, that basically encompasses, you know, most of what and or almost everything with respect to what needs to be changed on the board. And I think that maybe, maybe the governing legislation of the port needs to be looked at again um, to, to basically bring it into modern um, practice with, at this time. Um, One, two quick intervention there on, on the same N.D. Alfonso and Company Limited matter before I, I, I proceed from it. Mr. Grant, you indicated that um, somehow you give an impression that the firm of N.D. Alfonso and Company Limited was acting on behalf of, of the Ministry of Works and Transport and not the Port Authority. But there is an invoice that I have here dated 18th of July 2014, and it clearly states client, Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago, in the account with N.D. Alfonso and Company Limited. So for you, the invoice is a total of $840,750. So to invoice an entity, you must have been engaged in some formal way for the invoice to be processed through the accounts department and paid, and obviously subject to audit. So that's one issue I want to correct for the records. And secondly, what is most alarming here is that part of this invoice that N.D. Alfonso is billing, billing the Port Authority for includes conferences and negotiation with Mr. Powell of ICSL, who at the time, by letter, Alfonso had indicated that that company was working as an agent for Alfonso and Company Limited. Remember this case of the magistrate trying himself? This is untenable. It is double dipping. It is everything that spells of poor procurement, and I don't want to go further than that, but, but it is inconsistent at a minimum. And I just want to go on the records as saying that Mr. Alfonso and other parties related to this matter will be appearing later, and I will have the opportunity to question them. But I just wanted to question the ports management on their side of the story, because I have an invoice here that clearly states the client is the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, um, having regard to the disclosure by the chairman yesterday that there was no chat party or charter party agreement executed for the Atlantic provider and the MV transporter. I would like to ask Mr. Chairman, the chairman of the port, is it usual for the authority to enter into contracts and make payments in respect of vessels used by it without there being a written contract in place. 
I want to ask further, how were payments made to these owners and operators of these vessels in the absence of a contract? And is this not a breach of standard payment protocols in the public sector, which as a former permanent secretary, you would be well familiar with. I would like you to provide this committee with some clarification on this matter, please. As I said, <clears throat> excuse me, as I said yesterday, um, my information was that there was no charter party um, agreement executed between the Ministry of Works and Transport and the entities for the provider and the barge. What I was advised is that the, there was a, a letter of engagement that was executed between the ministry and the providers. The Port Authority does not enter into um, agreements for the the um, the contracts, you know, contracting of vessels for the inter-island service. The Act is very clear that the government shipping service is a government entity, and the port acts as the agent, as directed by the owner, which is the government. And therefore, the once that is done, the the, the, the port basically carries out and, and you know it's, ensures that the operations are there and that we carry out the engagement as directed. In so far as payment is done, the port makes a request to the Ministry of Works and Transport you know, for the, um, the payments that are to be made and the Ministry of Works and Transport provides the necessary funding that is required for the payment to the providers. This particular breach in terms of the absence of a contract is a matter that would fall squarely in the lap of the Ministry of Works and Transport and not the Port Authority, according to what you have just indicated? Well, the, in, 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 in effect, yes. The, the Ministry of Works and Transport has the responsibility um, for the engagement. They are the ones who sign the Charter Party or whatever contractual arrangement is required. Do you have any idea at this time what it costs the taxpayers of this country to retain the services given those irregular conditions of both the Atlantic provider and the Trinity transporter along with the MV Guardian, which is a tug, I understand, that had to accompany the Trinity transporter. Do you have an idea as to what was the final total value in money terms, dollars and cents, for those two vessels, or three, including tug, during the period that they were engaged under what I would like to describe as very dubious conditions in the absence of any contract. What was the final figure? Could you provide that to this committee, please? Yeah. 
Um, I, would, I would ask the deputy chair who was involved in the negotiations for um, those two to respond. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm sure you. The contract for the Trinity Transporter um, was negotiated at an agreed price of US $8,000 per month on a month-to-month -month basis um, up to um, a period of three months, not exceeding three months. The original asking price for that um, vessel, which is a Roro, which is a Roro barge, tug and barge arrangement, the company asked for US $12,000 per day. I negotiated that down to 8,000 US dollars per day without any mobilization cost because the vessel was immediately available in Trinidad and Tobago. So there was no mobilization attached to bringing the vessel to Trinidad as would occur with a foreign enterprise. In addition to which we made it clear that there would be no associated or add-on charges for the provision of that service. So it was extremely well, um, well costed in terms of the, the economy of, of providing that vessel. Of course, the the problem with the Roro barge is that um, it takes a longer transit time to get from Trinidad to Tobago at a slower service speed. I think the average transit time was in the vicinity of 11 hours. Did, and you, say, did you say 8,000 US per month? Or is it 8,000 per day? Per day, sorry. 8,000 US per day. Sorry. Um, the second vessel, the Atlantic provider, um, I also negotiated that contract down. The, Asking price was US $14,500 per day. I brought it down to $14,000 US per day. No mobilization fee, no additional or associated cost. Consequently, the vessel used towage services and, and other ancillary services, which they incurred at their own cost. Um, if you compare that, for example, with the previous uh, negotiated arrangement with the Superfast Galicia, in which the Port Authority incurred additional costs of tug and barge and barge attendance and so on, including civil engineering works, steel works and paving works. It was extremely uh, economical for our purposes. Um, secondly, a letter of award was prepared by the Permanent Secretary and issued to the, and also draft contracts were prepared. So they may not have been executed by the ministry, but draft contracts were prepared. Uh, you may direct those questions to Mr. Marvin Gonzalez, the legal advisor, the Ministry of Works and Transport. Because I know there's a number of questions are coming up here with respect to cabinet notes and cabinet approvals and so on, which quite properly should be directed to the ministry. Could you give us the total of the, the value, the total value? The Can management I... will give you that figure. Yes, thank you. Sorry. The total for the Atlantic provider over the period 23rd April to 21st July, 11.6 million TT. Um, the total for the Trinity Transporter and the Trade Winds Tug over the period 23rd July, 23rd April, sorry, to 16th July is 6.3 million TT. Thank you. May I also ask Mr. Chairman, through the Chairman of the Port, who were the main negotiators for the Cabo Star and the Ocean Flower too? And could you also indicate at the same time who, who are the members who constituted the management evaluation team for those two vessels. Sorry, Just give me one second, Mr. Chairman, to pull up the information. Here. Mm -hmm. I have done. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
The members of the board and the executive management present during the negotiations were Commissioner Ainsworth Mohammed, Commissioner Dexter Jagannath, Charmaine Lewis, Acting General Manager, Chief Executive Officer, Leon Grant, Chief Executive Officer, TTIT, Nikisha Charles, Legal Advisor, Curtis James, Executive Manager, Finance, Ms. Marcia Elbon Charles, Corporate Secretary, and myself under the direction of the Chairman. That is the evaluation team? Or no, no, no. You asked about the negotiating team. Yeah. yeah. What about your management? Do you have a I'll pass that question on to the general manager, the executive management team. And could you tell me who was the chairman of that negotiating team? No, 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 no. Your team that you are a member of. The chairman re requested me to lead the negotiations under her direction. So you were the lead negotiator for this? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Let me, yeah. Mr. Grant, go ahead, yeah. Yes, if I may answer the questions, Chair. The evaluation team comprised of myself as chair of the evaluation team. We had Mr. Curtis James. He was the executive manager of finance. We had the legal officer, Nikisha Charles. We had Jason Buckley, an accountant, and Sunarine Babo, who was the engineer. Sorry, good morning again. I just want to sort of create a context going forward because we're hearing questions coming from different areas. And one of the things that happened yesterday when we were asking you the questions is that we got that holistic approach whereby we understood that the issues would have been maintenance, which would have led us to this point as one, and that transition between foreign companies to local control um, dealing with the cargo vessels and whatnot. So what I want to find out now, um, going forward in the future, is are you tracking in regards to the operations of the Cargo Star, which is the cargo vessel, it is, uh, its um, efficiency managing the service now? Because I know that that vessel is only here for a year on a one-year contract, and I think three months is gone already, so you have seven months left. And I am also aware that recommendations would have been put forward um, to sort of procure our own vessel by way of a cargo vessel. I think that will be three years out. So I'm really, really asking, given that you have a year, seven months left on the cargo star, has the process begun to make sure that there's either a transition or to keep that vessel so that the bridge itself maintains a certain standard? That's with the cargo vessel. Um, in keeping with the, the ferries themselves, as much as a process began to procure a vessel to alleviate the troubles on the sea bridge in terms of traveling passengers, would you, in your opinion, based on the board itself, because there are investigations going on, gotten feedback as to what would have gone awry in that process, so much so that as you're going back out to tender now, what strategies are you putting in place to ensure that that doesn't happen again to the benefit of the people of Tobago and of Trinidad and Tobago? So that's two questions. And what I'm really asking is, what assurances can you really give going forward for both the cargo vessels and the ferries that we can get this right this time around? Okay. Um, let, me, let me deal with a couple of the questions and Mr. Behari will deal with um, the, plan. The, the, the plan going forward. I, I just want to, to say that um, whilst, you know, there, there has been um, a lot of discussion and talk with respect to what has gone awry, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I like to put things in, in context in terms of what we met and in terms of what we had to deal with. And, I, and whilst one would say that things have gone awry, I believe that, that to a large extent, the, 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 you know, the whole question of the emergency provisions that, that had to be employed and the, the, the time frame 
within which we had to do things. We would have preferred to have more time, but we did not have that luxury. And therefore, a number of things had to be done in short order. I think that, that overall, um, you know, there, there, there would have been, um, you know, other things that we would have, we would have liked to do, um, which we could not do during the, during the process, and the time frame within which we had to do things was very, it, it was a very tight time frame. In terms of, of going forward, I, I think that on the cargo vessel, we get daily reports. Um, the management gets daily reports from the, the um, operators of the Carbooster. There are issues that we have addressed, we have been able to address, um, coming out of some of the complaints that, that we have had, and we have addressed those. Um, we have brought it to the attention of the, the um, operators of the vessel that they need to do, needed to do certain things, and those things have been done. Um, at their cost. As I said, it's a, it's a charter arrangement. They have to provide a service, and therefore, um, the, the responsibility is theirs. What we've been doing is tracking and, and, and trying to sort of get the management to, as I say, to close mark them so that you know, things don't get out of hand and that if there's something that needs to be rectified, it is done. Um, so we have, be, we have been doing that. We have gone out to tender. Um, on the fast ferries uh, for a replacement for a period. The government has taken a decision also on the, the, um, the cargo vessel that they, you know, they would be looking for a new cargo vessel which would take, we believe, approximately three years, three years to build. And in the interim, uh, we have looked at, at um, the specifications that we've had, we've revised them, we've sent them to the Ministry of Works and Transport to get approval so that we can get something that would bridge that, that gap until a new built vessel is had um, from, you know, once the government uh, takes that decision. Um, again, as I say, you know, it is a, it is a question of the, the decisions that the government would make vis-a-vis -vis what it intends to do in terms of the policy on the sea bridge, but you know we have made certain recommendations with respect to, to that. Okay. Um, from what I've heard regarding the ferries themselves and the urgency, and that you would have liked a little more time to be able to operate in terms of um, procuring another vessel, doesn't the urgency still exist? And therefore, given that it still does, how would you address it this time around um, going forward? Again, remember there are individuals who are looking on to whom this is important because the rationale is very inquiry speaks to the impact of the sea bridge and the business and tourist activity in Tobago, as well as the significant independ ind interdependencies between the two islands. So there must be some um, kind of assurance that going forward, given that the urgency still exists to a certain extent, um, that this time around we're going to get it right. I just want to make a comment on that. We, we have already gone out um, based on a decision of the Cabinet. Uh, we have a tender in process, which is due to close, as I said yesterday, on the 28th of this month. Um, and we expect, based on the responses that we have so far, that you know there is quite a bit of interest, and we have. Um, so we, you know, we will be going through the exercise and the process of doing the evaluations, etc. We have asked for a, a multidisciplinary team, to you know, comprising persons not just of the port but also the Ministry of Works and Transport in the various divisions to comprise that evaluation team um, so that, you know, we would get the best possible, um, you know, uh, experience, knowledge, and, you know, to, to bring to bear on that evaluation exercise as we go forward. Um, Ms. Chair, um, I'm going to go back to the maintenance. Uh, when the Superfast Alicia contract in May 2014 was agreed upon, it was known that there were adjustments to be made to the infrastructure at Queen's Wharf in order to allow the vessels to properly boot. 
Why was this work not done up to 2015? But the contract for that vessel was renewed twice. I'm asking that question to Mr. Leon Grant um, on the port. I know that the two chair, I know that the port authority would have made representation to the ministry to have those works executed or provide the funding for the execution of those works. The funding was, was not made available to the port. Um, I want to ask a direct question. Was there any damage reported by Udicott to Hyatt as a result of this vessel um, written at the Hyatt? To your knowledge? Yes, the port is in receipt of a, a letter from UDCOT concerning that. And the port authority would have engaged the services of an engineering firm to have a look at it and to determine whether any damage was done or not. Yesterday we heard um, from a submission from the former board. Um, where he said that there was clearance and that no damage was done. Can you um, agree with what was said yesterday? Yes, I can. We engaged a firm to dive to check the integrity of the seabed. And the report emerging from that exercise indicated that the seabed was intact. There was no compromise to the, to the, the seawall. Sorry, the seawall was intact and there was no compromise to the seawall. So, okay, our last question. Um, on inspection of the Superfast Galicia by Mr. Leon Grant, Mr. Chairman, um, from information we have received here in your submissions, um, the report noted five weaknesses affecting the vessel. In light of those weaknesses, what would have been the basis for recommending that vessel? Based on the report that was submitted by myself, when we got back from Gibraltar, we would have submitted the report to the board. The board, in turn, would have liaised with the ministry. The ministry would have asked me to prepare a plan as to how we could address the concerns raised in the report and whether or not anything could be done to allow the vessel to move. I would have written back or written to the board then to indicate to them what sort of actions could be taken to facilitate the booting of the superfast. And it was after that was submitted, the board then agreed that we would execute those works. And that is the basis on which the superfast would have come to Trinidad. Can you outline the five weaknesses that you recognize? I don't have the document in front of me. What I could recall, um, if I may, um, is that normally when a cargo vessel is here or a conventional type ferry, normally we have a jetty that would normally facilitate the booting of a vessel like that. And what had happened is that we don't have the depth of water at the ferry terminal where it's, where it's normally booth. And therefore, it couldn't birth in its usual place, so it had to birth down at Queen's Wharf. And to do that, we would have had to do some reconfiguration to the birth of, of, the, um, of the key wall to allow it to birth um, in Port of Spain. So it was those, one of those were the recommendations that I would have made with respect to that. Um, when we did the analysis further, we did um, indicate that we would have had to have a badge in order to facilitate the booting. 
um, because we did, we did communicate with the Pilots Authority or Pilots Association and different stakeholders to see whether the vessels could have come in to birth stern too. Um, that was difficult from all the tests that we did and the captain wasn't very comfortable doing that. Um, therefore, it would have been in the way of the channel and it may have created some accidents. Um, so therefore, it was decided that we'd both alongside with the use of a barge. So that um, I'm hearing two different answers. I'm hearing on the same question, a different response from Mrs. Lewis, Mr. Chairman, and I'm hearing a different response from Mr. Grand relative to the Burton arrangement with that super fast school this year. Um, whom am I to ask this question to for verification? Should I maybe call in an expert to tell us what is really the situation? Because um, I asked the both of you the same question and I got a different answer. So the hired question, basically you indirectly answered that there is a problem with the birthing. And Ms. Lewis answered in the positive that it was no problem with the birthing. If I may add to that, the issue of the Hyatt came up when the superfast is departing the birth on an afternoon. Um, when it was departing the booth on an afternoon, there were some occasions that the Hyatt complained that they had a rumbling sound. And uh, they were basing it on the, when the superfast was leaving the booth. And I know we had a couple of meetings with the Hyatt, um, listening to their concerns, and we would have engaged with the captain of the superfast, indicating to him that, listen, when you're leaving the booth, there is a problem with the Hyatt. They complained about the fact that um, the, the whole hotel itself or some parts of the hotel was shaking. And uh, when that came up, the captain did some alternative maneuverings and uh, that would have been alleviated. The question you asked initially about the Hyatt and in terms of if there were any, what we did, as I said, is that I know that we engaged someone to do some diving and to check to see exactly what was taking place with the Hyatt. And to this date, we haven't had any confirmation that any damage was caused to it. So apart from the Burton, what were the other four recommendations that you made on that occasion for entering into the contract for the Galicia? What were the other four issues? What we had to do is we had to reconfigure the barge and that we had to build a ramp to allow trucks and vehicles to go on to the barge and then go on to the super fast Galicia. So the Galicia would have been booting alongside, rest, putting down its ramp, and then we had to have a ramp from shore to the barge in order to allow for the smooth movement of vehicles in and out onto the vessel. And then we had to do some reconfiguration with respect to the, the ISPS requirements with respect to security. And because you know we can't have local cargo moving through an international space with international cargo. So we had to do some reconfiguration in terms of fencing and demarcation to ensure that there is no mix between local cargo and international cargo. So there's some infrastructure works done on the shore side. And we also had to have, uh, with the barge came a dedicated crew that would work on the barge um, to ensure the safety of the operations. And we also had to add additional labor with respect to the, to the barge. So that would be a quite a substantial sum to intent and agreement to the purchase of a vessel. And I want to bring it to present tense now. So I understand that you were one of the persons selected to go to Gibraltar to look at the vessel that we now speak about. Um, is it Gibraltar? To look at the, yes. You along with an independent evaluator. So can we say it was really out of place or 
that an evaluator would indicate certain weaknesses to be addressed before government entered into a contract for a particular book vessel? Repeat the question again. No. From what I read in your submissions, you will, along with an independent evaluator, you traveled abroad along with another a team of persons to look at this vessel that we have recently maybe would have acquired. Okay? No, Is that okay. true? No, we won't. There was no plan to acquire the super fast colleagues. No, I'm in present tense now. Oh. I'm in present tense with the two vessels that were recently dealt with. Or the ocean, ocean flower, flower too. Flower and oh. Brian. So you, along with an independent evaluator, left Trinidad to go and look at those vessels. And from what I read, you made certain observations about a vessel. Yes. Is that normal or abnormal that you would do that and it would be fixed or something would happen before that vessel sails to, the, to this country? Let me just um, make a slight correction. Um, I did go and accompanied by the chief engineer who is an employee of the Port Authority. He's on the spirit of the express right now as we speak. So both of us did go to Panama um, to look at the ocean floor too. And uh, in visiting Panama, we would have done sea trials with the, with the ocean flower too. It was at the sea trials that we made certain observations. And uh, those observations were communicated to the port board. Can you tell me what's the procedure when these things happen? First of all, and I want to relate you back to the arrangements you had with um, sorry, okay. I just want to relate you back to the Galicia issue and how we contracted the Galicia with problems, and we go into present tense with what was observed and the issues recognized. With the ocean flower too, we made the observations. And it, those observations were documented, and there were a long list of observations, a long list, list of issues that required, it was more of an engineering or technical aspect to the vessel. And um, we made the, rec we, we, no, we, we did our reports indicating what we observed and our concerns with respect to the ocean floor too. With respect to the Galicia, the ship itself, we didn't have an issue with the ship itself, with the Galicia. The technical aspect of the vessel was not in question. The issue was, is the boating arrangements with respect to the vessel when it comes to Fort of Spain. And at least, Yes, so those issues, I was asked to make some recommendations of how we could address the shore side issues, and it's in that context that those suggestions were made, and they were corrected or addressed so that the Galicia could have put. As we come to a close for this morning session of the second public hearing of the committee, pursuant to the committee's inquiry into the Trail and Tobago Inter Island Ferry Service, with specific focus on the procurement and management of the ferries, I just wish to remind our viewers that our objectives are to understand the current state of the ferry service in Trail and Tobago to examine the policies and procedures used to acquire ferries and to ensure that value for money is obtained, to determine whether due diligence governed the conduct of all aspects of the maintenance and management of the provisions of the Seabridge service, and finally to determine the changes and challenges 
with respect to the maintenance of ferries. Um, so there are just two questions I'd like to raise before we uh, suspend for lunch. And the first of that is with regard to the issue of mites and other forms of infestation, um, I wanted some clarity from the chairman as to who exercises um, health jurisdiction over the port. Is it Port Health, is it from uh, Ministry of Health, or is it um, the Health Inspectorate of Port of Spain City Corporation? It is the health and safety, uh, the Port Health and Safety. Um, so that the Ministry of Health Inspectorate are the ones who yeah, they come. Visit your compound. They, they, yes. Uh, and you have had legal, because I know there used to be a uh, bit of a conflict between Port of Spain City Corporation's Health Department and the Ministry of Health over who should be exercising jurisdiction. So that matter has been resolved. I as far as you are aware. As far as I am aware. The, as far as I'm aware, there is no issue. Okay. The, the other question relates to certification and generally licensing of um, vessels that uh, come into your jurisdiction. Um, who handles that? Who's the authority? Is it the Director of Marine Maritime Services at Ministry yes, of Works? Yes, the Ministry of Works and Transport, the Maritime Services Division of the Ministry uh, of Works and Transport. Okay, and you are satisfied that um, with regard to the vessels we have been scrutinizing that, you know, form part of the charter party agreements and so on, that they have met all the requirements of these yes. licensing and certification arrangements. As far as I'm aware, they will not be given certification to operate if they don't meet the requirements of the Ministry of the Maritime Services Division. And is it this part is of a, your normal part, procedure to procedure. Uh, insist on seeing things like insurances and so on? Yes, they are, they are all part of, of the arrangement. Okay. And in that regard, um, what has your relationship with the transport board been? The Ministry of Works and Transport. So you all have interacted directly with the transport board? The transport management, board, the, road the, road the, the, no, we're talking about maritime transport, not I'm, road transport. I'm talking about the transport board of Trinidad and Tobago. Have you had interactions no. with them? No. no. Okay. Are there any closing remarks you care to make? I, ju I would just like to thank the committee for the opportunity for us to, um, you know, air our positions on, on a number of these issues that have arisen. And I want to assure persons that this board, we would do everything that is in our power and within the authorities that we have in order to try to make the Port Authority an efficient and productive port for Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, I want to thank you for your assistance in our deliberations and to remind you that the committee reserves the right to recall you if there are any, you know, other information coming before us that may conflict with what you have brought to our attention. Again, I thank you and this sitting is suspended until 1.05 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>